We're good? All right, we're good. Very good. All right, so um, today's topic I will be preaching on love, which as Luke alluded to, is a uh, you know very small, easily definable uh, topic here. Um, I mean, what could go wrong with a topic where I could say I love pizza and I love my wife, and you guys understand uh, what the difference is. There's just so many kinds of love. And as I thought through that, uh, one thought became almost immediately clear. Uh, there's only one kind of love that I need to focus on, and that is God's love. So in our passage today, which I'm hoping to bring your attention to, it's a very familiar one. And there are times when I love familiarity. Um, I love coming home to my house because it's familiar. I love my wife's cooking because it's familiar. I love my spot on the couch because that's my spot, right? That's my comfort. Familiarity um, is comfy. It's cozy. It's warm. And perhaps most important, uh, in a world full of unknowns, familiarity is a known. And it feels pretty good. But there are times when I wish I could distance myself from familiarity, and this is one of them. Uh, our verse today is, uh, part of it is John 3.16, and that's so well known that the uh, tendency is to just read it and skim right over it, right? And we don't really think deep about what this is actually saying because we are so familiar with it. But today, uh, God willing, I'm hoping to break this verse down uh, and treat it like a diamond. And we're going to look at one facet, and then I'm going to turn it, and we're going to look at another facet, and turn it, and look at another facet. And my hope is that we will see this verse with new eyes, and if the Holy Spirit allows, uh, that we will never see it the same way again. So today's passage is John 3, 16 through 19. Martin Luther famously said of John 3.16, it is the Bible in miniature, meaning that the, entire, the entirety of the Bible can be summed up in the 24 words of John 3.16. It is indeed a marvelous verse voiced by our marvelous Lord and Savior. But before we even get into the text, so anyway, don't read that text yet, because... Uh, I need to ask a favor, and the favor is as if you had never heard this verse before, right? Just pretend as if, what if this was the very first time you were ever hearing this verse? What would this sound like to you? So let's listen and read these words afresh and anew. John three sixteen through 19. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. All right, so let's start breaking down our text here. John 3.16. For... And we're just going to stop right there, right? Because this word demands attention. We really can't go any further. Um, you see, for is a primary participle that says, because of what I just said, what I am about to say now applies or is true. So logically, we have to understand what was said in order to understand what is being said. Now, I could, honestly, I could go all the way back to John 1.1, 1, 1. I'm not going to, obviously, but 
Um, I really could because this really is the pivotal uh, moment in the book of John. This is really where everything hinges. So we're going to stop here. I'm not going to go back to John 1.1, 1, 1, but I am going to go back to John 3. One, the first verse in the chapter that we're in. I'm just going to set the stage for, for a quick minute here. And it's only because the framework of what is happening around this verse could really help us understand John 3.16 and the astounding love uh, displayed in John 3.16. So, setting the stage. Nicodemus here is the audience, right? And just pausing for a moment to understand who he is and his background will help us understand some aspects of what's going on in our passage today. So who is Nicodemus? Well, in John 3.10, Jesus calls him the teacher, right? He says, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you don't understand these things? So Nicodemus was at least one of, if not the highest teacher in Israel. So it's reasonable to assume here, again, without really going in and fully fleshing all this out, it's reasonable to assume, knowing what we know about the Pharisees and their fanaticalness about works-based system, that um, Nicodemus, at least at this stage in his life, is here most likely looking for the works um, that Jesus uh, is able to do. What does he have to do to reach the things that Jesus is able to do because he knew that Jesus was even higher. You can see this in John 3, 1, verse 2, where he says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for not for no one can do these signs you do unless God is with him. Now, again, he's here for the wrong pretenses, and we can kind of see it in his question here. He's just looking for that next thing to do. What's the next work or the next lesson or the next thing that he can learn so that he can do the signs that Jesus is able to do. He wanted the signs. That's why he phrased that question or that statement in that way. That's what he was focused on. But then you look in verse 3 and look at what Jesus does here. I mean, this isn't Jesus's first rodeo with the Pharisees, right? He just cuts right through to the heart of it. And he says, truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, which, if you think about it, it's a little bit weird of a response, right? If Nicodemus is trying to compliment Jesus, saying, we know that you're this special guy, and, and Jesus is like, okay, hold on, hold on. I just, I don't have time for false ceremonies or fallacies. Right to the heart of it, unless you are born again, you cannot, under, you cannot see the kingdom of God. He is saying you won't understand anything if you don't start again. If you bring any of that old life into this new life, you simply will not get it. You have to start from scratch with an entirely new life. And listen to what he says again. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And it's the same with us today. So here's my first point, even before we get to our actual passage. And the first point is this. There are no good works that you can do to earn God's love. However, God's love should serve as motivation for you to do good works. Serving God is not a works-based system. It is a system based upon pure True and total love. Now, works result from that, of course, but it's not the base. It's not the foundation. That is why Jesus went straight to the heart there against Nicodemus about being born again. But Nicodemus, right, he's persistent. He just keeps banging that drum, right? Still searching for the task. And in verse 4, he says, How can a man be born again when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born so Jesus gives them this illustration about, this earthly illustration about being born, and Nicodemus doesn't even get that. So Jesus then says, if I have told you of these earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Okay. Now I say all of that to say this. As we approach our verse here, we have to understand that Jesus is talking about higher things. 
He's not talking about human and earthly emotions. So we just need to get our minds up a little bit this morning. Uh, think on a more grander scale. Uh, human emotion uh, is one thing, but this passage we're about to read is on an entirely different plane. Jesus goes on in verses 14 and 15. We're almost to our passage here. He goes on in verses 14 and 15, and he says, As Moses is lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. See, again, Jesus understood his audience. He knew that Nicodemus would understand that reference. And Jesus was trying to tell him that for everything that you understand, you don't understand anything. And these two verses, they would have been a radical revelation to a Pharisee who has dedicated his entire life to the doing and not the being. If you don't remember or you don't know, just real quick, back in the Old Testament, Numbers 21, uh, the Israelites had just come out of Egypt. They just crossed the Red Sea, and they were complaining about the food and the situation and all that. And so God sent snakes among them, and the snakes bit the Israelites. And then God told Moses, you know, put a snake on a, on a pole and lift it up high, and anybody that looks at the pole will be healed, i.e., they will be saved, right? The metaphor is very clear. Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, he's saying, look, you have spent your entire life in the doing. but All you have to do is look at the cross and you will have eternal life. Because of Jesus' sufferings on the cross, if you believe, you will have eternal life. Because of what Jesus was going to do on the cross at that time and has now done, we can know the love of God. You see how deep this goes. Everybody wants to focus on John 3.16, but how can you understand John 3.16 unless you understand what it cost God in verses 14 and 15? The only way you're going to understand this to the depths of your soul. Dear friends, this is crucial. Please hear me. Nothing held Jesus to the cross, other than his desire to save us. The Romans did not hold him there. The nails did not hold him there. The only reason he didn't come down off that cross as his taunters taunted him to do was because of his desire to save you and to save us. That is it. That is the only thing that held him there was his love for you. That's what held him there. As Alexander McLaren said, and this is just beautiful, he said, this sacrifice was bound to the altar by the cords of love. It's beautiful. And oh, it just it makes me angry when I hear people take John 3.16. And they take it as a means to allow for sin, right? Just this, like, well, if God so loved the world, then he must be okay if I'm sinning, right? It's preposterous. And it cheapens the verse, which is probably even worse. Thinking how that somehow God winks at sin because he so loved the world. They take these magnificent words and they prostitute them out to justify their own sin. And it's a travesty. They think they have the best out of this verse because it allows them to keep on to their sin when the truth is just simply and so much better. And I just, I don't understand why people fight against this. I mean, this is love, right? I mean, this is true love, love that builds up, love that grows, love that edifies, and it makes whole, it changes lives. I don't understand why people fight against it and they trade all of that in for the momentary pleasures of sin, which often lead to destruction. But may it not be so with us. So look upon the cross, dear friends. Look and be saved, yes, but look and be loved. All right, let's get to our passage now. For uh, 
Verse 16, For God so loved the world. Um, next, I just want to turn our attention to the little word, uh, so. For God so loved the world. That, that little word there, so, there's a distinction there, isn't there? I mean, Jesus could have said God loved the world, right? And the same point would have gotten across, the same message would have gotten across, but he put that word so in there. Why? It conveys something more, right? Do you see how that word changes this passage? It doesn't just love the world. God so loves the world. This past summer, um, I taught a class called Immersion, and it's just a study, it's a six or eight week study on how to study the Bible. And we just give tips and tricks and things that you can do to get more out of your Bible study. And one of those tips or tricks or tactics, whatever you want to call it, one of those ways that you can study the Bible, especially when it comes to familiar verses, is simply just to emphasize every word of the passage. So for our passage today, it would be, for God so loved the world. And we already looked at what the for does, right? It takes us back. And then we could say, for God so loved the world. And you can write, you know, the implications of God loving the world versus a human or whatever. For God so loved the world. And because of that tactic, this word jumped out at me. That it is not just God loved the world. It's that he so loved the world. And those two little letters, which are so easily overlooked, drastically changed this verse. For God so loved the world. It's amazing. He didn't just love the world. And that would have been astounding enough. That would have been enough. But he didn't just love the world. He so loved it, which means he loves it with an intensity. He loves it with a passion, with an activeness. Not a passive longing. And then it gets even more amazing when you consider this. I swear I could do this for like every word in this passage. But let's just pause for a moment and look at the word world for a minute. What's he talking about there? For God so loved the world. He's not talking about the earth, right? In regards to, you know, mountains and trees and grass and water and stuff. He's not talking about the earth. He's talking about the world. He's talking about humans in their fallen state, in their rebellious state, that's where he so loves the world. That's glorious. I have to flesh this one out a little bit more because it's so crucial to our understanding. We have to get this. Let's look at what Paul says in Romans 5.7. I think that will be up on the screen there. He says... Paul says in Romans 5, 7, Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. And then look at the contrast here. He says, but God demonstrates. He demonstrates. You see, it, it's on display. It, 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 it's right here. It's visible. You can see it. All you have to do is look. It's like the giant serpent on the pole. All you have to do is look at it, and you can see. It's not some you know, deep philosophical uh, thought out in the uh, you know, reaches of only the deep and learned can understand. It's not some nebulous idea that's way out in the far reaches of the cosmos that we can't understand. It's not some confusing thing that's only whispered about in the dark corners of Christianity that you need a master's degree to understand. It's here. It's demonstrated. It's demonstrated, historically verified, and demonstrated. It's displayed. It's paraded. It's shown. It's visible. You can see it. You just have to look for it. God demonstrates His own love. What does He demonstrate? He demonstrates His own love for us. How? In this that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Do you see that while we were spitting in His face and mocking Him, and as our voices were a part of the chorus calling for His crucifixion, He loved you enough to die 
for you. That's how God loved the world. That's how God so loved the world in that state. And he did it while we were actively rebelling against him. And not only at that time in history, but he did it for you today, in this time, if you're a believer. He found you where you are, and then he chose to save you while you were actively rebelling against him. He pulls you out of that muck and mire that you were in, and then he makes you his own, a co-heir and a friend. And then he trades his life for your life so that you're the perfect one, and he's the one that had to pay for your sin. You want to talk about love? What love is this? I mean, who can even begin to fathom this kind of love? For God so loved the world. Do those words mean maybe just a little bit different now? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. I have to pause again here for this word gave. Why gave? Why not sent? Why not he sent his only son? The same purpose, again, would have been accomplished, right? He, he, all he had to say was that God sent his son, and it would have been the same meaning, would have been the same, purpose, the same point. Why gave? I want to take us on a journey here. I want you guys to picture Christmas morning. Whatever Christmas morning looks like for you, um, just picture it, right? Get that feeling. It's that early morning. You know, maybe the sun's not even up in our house. It's not even up, right? Kids are down. Trees lit in the corner, it's sparkling. We got all the gifts right there. Whatever that feeling is, and you're with your friends, you're with your family, just picture that for a moment. You have that feeling? I want you to picture this. I want you to picture God comes into your living room. I want you to picture he comes into your living room and um, he hands you a gift. And oh, it's perfect. The gift is perfect. It's got the big, you know, golden bow on it, and the, the paper's all flat. It's like nothing like what I wrap, right? It's just the paper's all flat, and the edges are like, it's just perfect. It's just this perfect box. And so you pull the you pull the ribbon, it falls off. You grab the paper, you rip it down. It's just a perfect gift. And you turn it over, and you open the box, and there is Jesus. So you look up the guy, right? A little bit confused. And he says, that's my gift to you. How do you respond to that gift? You respond to it like, you know, like when you get socks, like, oh, gee, God, that's, uh, that's really nice. Uh, it's a thought that counts, right? It's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's good. Uh, I mean, it's nice. I'll, I'm sure I'll use it. I'm sure I'll use it. It's, it's uh, you know, thank you. It's, I'm sure I'm going to use it. Thanks. Or do you take that gift and hug it and kiss it and weep over it? And cry in thankfulness over it. Maybe push it to your chest. Push it to your cheek. Do you love it? It's the greatest gift in the world. And John 3.16 tells you that God gave it to you. Put anything up against this gift. Put anything up against it and tell me what's more worth it. A house, a car, boats. What, put anything up against this gift and what do you want more? There is no Xbox game, no sweater, no Lexus car with a big red ribbon on it. There is nothing that you can put up against this gift and it be better than. What are we seeking after? For God so loved the world that he gave, oh goodness, that he gave, I'm not doing too good here, John. I'm, I'm halfway through one verse, right? And I got, I got, four, got four more to get through. Um, I kind of feel bad. John, he gives me nine verses. I'll preach on three. 
So it gives me three verses. I'm preaching on half of one. Um, I'll try to pick it up here. But I do have to stop here. We have to talk about this, this his only son. Um, there's something here, again, it's just it's insanely important to understand if we're going to understand this verse. Uh, this, this, uh, the verse that we read is ESV. Um, can you put that back up on the screen here, Doug, real quick? John 3.16. Does any of our more seasoned scholars, does anybody notice what word is missing from there that's typically in a lot of the, at least the older translations? Anybody know? Begotten. begotten. Yeah, very good. That was easy. Yeah, the word begotten, right, is missing. Now, why? Real quick, interesting story here. Begotten came about because at one time, it was presumed that the term derived from the Greek words monos, which means one or only, and the term geneo, which means to beget. Beget means to bring into existence, right? To, in this case, it would be bring a child into existence. It also means to give rise to or to bring about, to create, right? So the translation only begotten was based upon this assumption. And it has been used by cults throughout the world for generations to suggest that Jesus was somehow created, as if he was begotten, like there was a time when he didn't exist. And that God had to bring him forth. Well, subsequent manuscript discoveries produced evidence that the term actually comes from the term monos, so that's the same, monos still equals one, and the, and the noun gene, which means kind or type. So it's one kind, one type. It's a type of one. Or we would say in our, in our terminology today, there is only one type. So the term monogonés, therefore, refers to the uniqueness of God and has no inherent reference to chronology, number, or origin. So Jesus is not one created into existence, but he is simply and confoundedly and marvelously uh, defined as one who one of a kind one of a kind he is wholly unique and that's the point that needs to be driven home here when we read his only son it's another facet of this verse that that is the gift that god gives to you the son is wholly unique he, and uh, i think it was alistair begg who said this it, it's not that there is something divine about Jesus. It's that Jesus defines what divinity is, right? There is not that, Jesus, that there's something unique about Jesus. Jesus defines what uniqueness is. He encompasses what unique is. He, he is wholly, entirely, and completely one of a kind. And this is the gift that God gives to you and us. This is the gift that he gives. Still in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, remember the audience here. This would have been a shocking statement to Nicodemus, right? You mean I only have to believe? What about all this stuff that I've been doing? What about all the chores and the laws and all this stuff that I've been working on my entire life? Whoever believes? It would have been fine if Jesus had said, well, whoever works really hard to keep the law, Nicodemus and Jesus would have been buddy buddies. He'd be like, hey, I'm right there. What do I got to do? But Jesus asked <laughs> The love of God is such that he takes their entire system and he flips it on their head as he's done his entire ministry, right? We're going through the book of Mark, and how many times have we seen Jesus just take their entire existence and flip it? And that's what he does here. Yes, is this is the love of God. So at this point, uh, the narrative seems to switch a little bit. And to be honest, when I got to this point in my preparation for this sermon, um, I kind of struggled with it um, because, you know, up to this point, it's just all love and God and feels good. And this is all 
And then it kind of seems to turn to this judgment and this condemnation. And then how do we reconcile these two uh, extremes into one sermon? Each verse is a great verse in and of itself, and each one would make a great sermon in and of itself. But how do we reconcile these into to one sermon? And as I wrestled with this, it just dawned on me that they're not exclusive to each other. That the reason our Lord said them back to back is because they go together. Like I said before, you can't understand verse 16 without understanding what it cost God in verses 14 and 15. And you can't understand verse 16 unless you understand the consequences laid out in verses 17 through 19. And so let's take a look at them now. Um, I really got to pick it up. So I'm just going to kind of summarize the main point to each verse here. Um, Verse 17. Yes, thank you. Uh, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Uh, I'll just summarize this point with this. God's motive does not equate to the results, right? So this verse says God did not send his son into the world. That was his motive. But you look at verse 19, he says what? And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. So the outcome still resulted, right? There was still judgment. There was still judgment that was not the motive of God. That's all verse 17 is saying. Verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in him is condemned already. And already is insanely important to understand uh, there. I don't have time to get into that right now. One thing I want to point out on this verse is there's two people in this world. There's two kinds of people. There's the not condemned and the condemned, right? We like to break it up into, you know, white, brown, black, red, green, Democrat, Republican, American, English, African, whatever. We like to break up. The Bible says there's two kinds of people in this world. There's the condemned and the un- and the and the non-condemned. And of course, the distinguishing is between them is who has not believed on the name of the Son of of God. And this is the judgment that light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. So I'm going to take all three of those verses. I'm just going to kind of go to my, uh, well, my almost conclusion. I I got a couple more. Um, Because we just spent a lot of time talking about the love of God. And that's good and that's right and we should focus on that and dwell upon that. But I do have to issue a warning here, and that's what these verses here are are warning us about. Now, this warning is for everybody, but it's especially for you young people. So, young people, I need every youth and 20-something to listen up, okay? What I am about to say will save your life. Everybody needs to hear this, but especially you young people. This will save your life or it will at least declutter some of the notions around what the love of God is. Okay, you ready? God, here it is. God is love, but love is not God. I'm going to say it again. Let this burn into your soul. That God is love. Yes, that is true. The Bible says that. that God is love. But love is not God. And in the world you guys are growing up in, love is God. It is absolutely fanatical about that pushing that phrase or that uh, thought. And I'll give you a perfect example of this. Uh, the other day I was watching, uh, I don't know what I was watching, I was on something and a video came up and it was a Muslim, or, and the caption to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the video said something along the lines of, uh, a Christian tries to share God with a Muslim and instantly regrets it, right? Something, they said something, but I just remember the phrase, instantly regrets it, right? That's kind of one of their, their catchphrases. To summarize the video, uh, the Muslim man basically slams the Christian God for punishing his son because of our sins. And his big argument at the end of the 
video, the, his crescendo to this argument was this. He said, my God is so loving, he does not have to punish his son in order to forgive sins. This video had millions of views to it. At that point, the video cut off. I don't know if the Christian gave a rebuttal, but that's where it stopped, right? And if you think about that, especially at first glance, I mean, that sounds pretty good, right? It sounds pretty good. How many of these millions of viewers didn't take the time to think about this critically, and they just accepted it? Of course, we're going to look at it a little bit closer. He said, my God is so loving, it does, he does not have to punish his son in order to forgive sins. So because Allah's love, because of Allah's love, he just, what? I mean, there's two options that he can do. He can either, one, just let the sinners go free, or two, he accepts them into their presence as they are, in their sinful state. Okay, It has to be one or the other, right? So if he just lets the sinners go free, well, let's apply that same logic to a human judge. This is an analogy I, I picked up from Ray Comfort. But he said, uh, let's just picture somebody murders your child or murders your parent or your sibling or whatever. And they're 100% guilty. They're standing before the judge, and the judge goes, you know what, because I'm so loving, I'm just going to let you go. What would you think of that judge? I mean, corrupt wouldn't even begin to describe your feelings about that judge, right? Matter of fact, as Paul Washer says this, you would call that, that judge a bigger monster than the person he let go, right? A bigger monster. Is that really an attribute that you want to assign to God? Of course, the only other option is to let sinful man come into his presence in their sinful state. Well, right away, that means that God can no longer be holy. But even if you look past that, what do we have then? We have a bunch of sinners in heaven with all the same stuff that we have down here. So we're still going to have gossiping and fighting and wars and murder and theft up in heaven. So I don't... I don't know where this, this is going from or where this is going to. This is the, 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 the fallacy of having love as God. If you just look at it for a second, it doesn't even hold up to human logic, let alone spiritual and divine scrutiny. So what's the refute to that argument? And the refute, the refute is this, that God, the true God, is not just love, but he is so much more. You see, his God was love, and that's fine, or it's okay. What it is, but our God is perfect. And you look at verses 17, 18, and 19, and that's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying that our God is infinitely love, yes, and he is also infinitely holy, infinitely just, infinitely righteous, infinitely merciful infinitely wrathful, infinitely faithful, and overall just infinitely perfect, just to name a few. And we just talked about this in my Sunday school a couple of weeks ago, but that God doesn't have to decrease one attribute in order to increase another attribute. He doesn't have to decrease his justice in order to increase his love. Paul Warsaw says if you study logic, that means that his love would be unjust, and then he wouldn't be God. And we worship the true God, not because he is love, but because he is worthy. And he is worthy because he is perfect. And he is perfect in every way that a being can be perfect. Don't you see, we worship a perfect God and not just a perfect God, but an infinitely perfect God. And that's the God who loves us. Oh, the worship that should spring from our hearts and from our souls when we consider these truths. Let this love of God motivate our prayers. So instead of being a chore 
or burden, know that you are loved and wanted and bust through these barricades and these false ceilings above us and pray to this God who loves you. Let this truth drive you gleefully into Scripture. And and instead of being cold, dead text, these stories will come alive and these people will come alive and reading Scripture will change your life. This is the God we worship. All right. So what are we supposed to do with this? Well, I just kind of gave you two... uh, with uh, scripture and prayer and let that be your motivation. But really what I, what I want you to do with this is just marvel in this, just marvel in this, especially right now during this Christmas season. Absolutely. But really, honestly, every single day, every single day you wake up, marvel at this wrap yourself in this rest in this. There are a thousand things that you can springboard off of this, but and if you have learned anything here today, that's what I would encourage you to do in every aspect of the Christian life. If you're afraid to share your faith, remember the love of God. If you don't want to read scripture, like I said, remember that God loves you. And if you're struggling with anything, anything, if you're struggling with it, remember that God loves you. In every aspect of the Christian life, whether it be parenting, whether it be career move, whether it be in in anything, anything you guys do, financial decision, remember the love of God. All right, real, real, real quick. um, Before I close, uh, real quick, I just want to give an update on Nicodemus. Um, It looks like he becomes a believer. I don't know. A lot of people didn't know this. I didn't know this. Um, if you look in John chapter 7, we see him in the process of getting saved because he offers the only defense of Jesus. John seven fifty through 53, Nicodemus, who had gone to him before, who, had, or who was one of them, said to them, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning about what he does? And they replied, are you from Galilee too? Search and see that, the, that there is no prophet that arises from Galilee. Point is, you can see Nicodemus there defending Jesus, right? Um, So he's arguing with the Pharisees. And then we all know about Joseph of Arimathea who came in and took Jesus' body off the cross. But do we know who gave the spices to bury Jesus? That's right, it was Nicodemus. John 19 says, uh, 1939, Nicodemus also, who earlier had had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of, of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So it appears that we have the good fortune to look forward to talking with Nicodemus in heaven. Okay, now I'm really closing on this. Um, I just want to give a visual representation here of God's love. And it comes in the form of a poem. Where's eh, Miss Ramona? This comes in the form of a poem. Uh, in regards to a stairwell, okay? In regards to a stairwell, here's the poem. Oh, long and dark the stairs I trod with trembling feet to find a God, gaining a foothold bit by bit, then slipping back and losing it, never progressing, striving still with weakening grasp and faltering will, bleeding to climb to God while he serenely smiled, unnoting me. Then came a certain time when I loosened my hold and fell thereby, down to the lowest step my fall as if I hadn't climbed at all. Now when I lay despairing there, listen, a footfall on the stair, on that same stair where I, afraid, faltered and fell and laid dismayed, And lo, when hope had ceased to be, my God came down the stairs to me. That is love. Let's pray. 
God, how can human minds even begin to comprehend this notion? How can we even begin to um, understand these, these truths? Only by the power of your Spirit, God. And I pray for myself and for all my friends here that this Christmas season won't just be another one. And, and God, not even Christmas, just this Sunday, today, that your Holy Spirit would help our minds consider and, and just revel, revel in you and worship God, worship you with our center of our beings because you are worthy. You are just worthy. And we pray for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Sorry, my